Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. What? <laughs> I think people are just squirrely tonight. They're, you just all are a little squirrely. That's all right. Um, well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, praise, praise the Lord. Lord. It is great to be in the house of the Lord. Here, it here. is so good seeing each and every one of you here. And uh, this is, is uh, incredible because we're just kind of trucking along. And, and really, I always, whenever I teach this, I uh, started teaching a couple of years ago. Um, actually, we were teaching it before it was published, but teaching a couple of years ago. And once it got to this point, it seemed like it was all downhill from here. I mean, it just seemed like it went. So it's going to get harder, but yeah. it's going to get harder, but it's going to go quicker. Does that make sense? No. And, and this is what I want to share with you as well. Um, if you have, if you do are doing real well in the book memorization, just as X was big, as far as Deuteronomy, if you're doing well, really well on that, it's really not necessary every day to write out, you know, three or five or seven times. If, if you're still doing that, if you say, he said, do it seven times, do it seven times. But I do encourage you to at least write it out once. I started abbreviating. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and because and, I know I know it's a lot of writing, but if you're not, I encourage you to do the repetition because that's what it does. It just so uh, if you've got it memorized, if you're doing really really good with that, then don't don't beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up because we are going to start getting more applicable, and we're going to start getting a little tougher. It's going to start getting a little more advanced as we go through. So. Um, it's good to see each and every one of you. This this uh, weekend is our fishing trip, and so it'll be starting on Friday, and, and some people stay until Sunday, some people come back on Monday, and so it's going to be a, a great time. If you're interested in going to that, that should be great. Um, so that is coming up. It's so hard to believe that Memorial Day is upon us. It's hard to believe that we're at the end of May already. So, all right, well, let me go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll get rolling. Father, thanks for this night. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you for the men uh, uh, cooking hot dogs for us and, and for the meal that they provide. And Lord, we just praise you because you're such a good God. You are so wonderful to us. And we're going to be talking about a topic tonight, Lord, that's very applicable. It's very needed. And it's one that uh, we're going to dig into and, and uh, give some specifics on how we can carry it out. So, Lord, I just ask that you'll have your way with us and that you'll be glorified in everything. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, we are going to then go through some books of the Bible, all the way through Amos. And I personally got to admit, I'll confess to you, this is where I always get, I, my order will always be different. I try to change the order as much as possible. And I've written it out 843 times, and I still always will get the order mixed up. So, if you get the order mixed up, when we get to the 12 minor prophets, that's what these guys are called. Uh, I always try to kind of mix them around, so uh, it's okay. It's okay. As long as you know the general vicinity, you're good. All right, so let's do it together. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Paul's songs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Excellent, excellent. And I always love when we do that because we start out Genesis, Exodus, and then when we get to Hosea, Joel, Joel. Uh, which, which one of those guys? So I always uh, like when we, we start out really, really strong. And isn't that, isn't that true in our Christian life? Boy, on Sunday, we're on, on top of the mountain. And boy, we're going to conquer the world for Jesus. And then we wake up Monday morning and the devil says, well, who, what are you doing? And so that's a kind of realistic. Um, Galatians 2.20 was our verse last week. And again, please remember, uh, uh, I want to encourage you, if, if you can only remember a nugget, if you can only remember just kind of the, the main point, of scripture. That to me is more important than having it exactly word for word. Matter of fact, if you'll hear when I quote scripture, it may be that main point 
or that main nugget come out and come out. And Galatians 2.20 is very powerful. So let's say Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Excellent. You guys are doing so great. You really are. You really are. And really, what I, I have memorized that is I've been co and because goes to the uh, King James Version. I've been co-crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And so that's what I try to remember. That's that's kind of how I memorize that verse and things like that. So we're going to be talking about a topic tonight that's very, very applicable, and, and we all know it, but it's one that we as Christians struggle with. It, it, it's a tough one, and, and it, it's, it's one that, that we are commanded to do, as we're going to see, but also it, it, it's one that it's easy to shrink away from, and it's one to kind of expect others to do it, or, or what well, we pay a pastor, that's his job, or what we do is, is, is we kind of feel uncomfortable for various things. But we're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about different approaches. So let's look at witnessing. This week is witnessing. We are commanded to witness. We're saved. We have been saved from sin. So we no longer have to live in trapped, powerless lives. We no longer have to be subjected to the slavery of the evil one. We've been delivered. We've been rescued. We've been redeemed. This is good news. And really, it's not good news. It's great news. Now, when we have great news in other areas of our lives, we can't wait to tell others. And well, we have the greatest news. And we're not to keep that to ourselves. We're to tell others. We're to witness to them. We want them to be saved too. So witnessing is when we're telling others about Jesus so that they can be saved. And, and really, it, it amazes me because uh, of social media, we have so much access now to talk about the good stuff. And, and the, the internet is a very interesting double-edged sword because there's a lot of junk on it, but there can also be a lot of positive. And, and if every Christian just put everything positive on there, it would be very, very effective. And so we have an opportunity now to tell people what Jesus is doing in our lives. As God created the heavens and the earth, he could not resist the opportunity to proclaim the good news throughout his work. The universe preaches the gospel. All of creation shouts out the glory of God. All of God's handiwork speaks of his love and his redemptive nature. God wants us to know him, and he wants everyone to know him. And there's good news that's proclaimed everywhere in the creation. You guys should know this verse. We did 12 weeks of it, uh, six weeks. We did six weeks of the constellations. Psalms 19.1, anybody remember that verse? The heavens... Declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. And that's what we talked about as we did the stars. And, you know, after, not, not to try to rush, but uh, if, what do we do get done with our discipleship on Wednesday nights? We're going to do comparative uh, uh, faith beliefs. And what, what, what do Muslims believe? What do Jewish people believe? What do the Buddhists believe? What do the Hindus believe? What does Scientology believe? So I encourage you. After we get through discipleship, we're going to go in depth and also how we as Christians can interact with them. And that's kind of a really fun study. We'll do that for about 10, 15 weeks. But anyway, uh, so everywhere, all you got to do is walk outside and see God's glory. All you got to do is walk outside and, and just, his beauty just is, is so incredible. And so um, the good news, is, and it really is, the good news is constantly being told. Well, we know we've been given the Great Commission, Matthew 28 to 19 and 20, to go, therefore, go out to the nation and, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit, making them all disciples. We've been entrusted with orders to take the good news out to the world. Now, we've all been given this mandate, not just those who work in full-time ministry, not just those who have seminary degrees or Bible degrees. We are to tell people about Jesus. Too many times... Christians have fallen back and say, well, I can't talk about the Lord because I don't have uh, some letters after my name. Or I can't talk about the Lord because I, I, I don't know that theological knowledge. Or I can't talk about the Lord because I don't know the big words. Yes, you can. And matter of fact, you're supposed to. It's, it's, I've told you this many times before, but when I first meet people, uh, I rarely tell them I'm a pastor in the very beginning. Because as soon as I tell them I'm pastor, they become very religious with me. <laughs> Even heathens. 
I mean, even the worst heathen. It's funny because I'll say, as soon as it comes out, I'm a pastor, they'll say, oh, pardon my French. I'm like, that wasn't French. Uh, that was American. Like, but using those words. And, and, and so, but they become, it's almost immediately as they find out a pastor, oh, I went to BBS when I was in third grade. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, and, and so what we need to do is we need to think about how we need to witness. And so some too many times when, when I they know I'm a pastor, they set up a wall right away. And that's why it's funny, you know, when I do tours at the Penn, uh, one of the first things I do is I say, you know, hey, uh, welcome to West Virginia Penitentiary. I'm C my CJ and I'm a local pastor here in town. And uh, and it's very funny how the tours go. You know <laughs> uh, we have a good time. It's it's amazing what a witness that has turned out to be in, in an incredible way. So this is what we need to know. Everyone, every one of us is to tell people about Jesus. Not just full-time pastors, not just those who've been to Bible college, everyone. Now, uh, we see that, that Mark 16, 15, it says, He said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So all of us are. Now, it's understandable that witnessing can be intimidating. It, it makes sense that sharing our faith can be challenging. We may feel we're inadequate. We may feel that it should be left up to the professionals. And that's a beautiful aspect of witnessing. We don't have to have all the answers. And I want to encourage that. Sometimes as Christians try to hide behind knowledge. It's okay to say, I don't know, but this is my experience. It's okay to say, I'm still learning that. Sometimes people will say to me, well, what about these questions that the Bible brings up? I'll say, That's good. those are good questions. You don't have to have every answer. It's okay. See, we don't have to have an inside and outside understanding of systematic theology. We can tell people about what God has done in our lives. We can share how we've seen God. So witnessing is telling others what we have seen. Matthew 11, 4, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. Jesus didn't say, well, of course I'm the Messiah. Jesus didn't just whip them, well, you have to believe. He said, what do you see? What do you see? And so what has God done in your life? And, and you know, when I think about that, I, I was... Uh, you know, grew up in the church, but I wrestled with that. Because one thing I got caught up in, I got caught up in watching people as a teenager. And I, I would see someone who was testifying on Sunday night, and we had, on Sunday nights was our testimony time, I'd see someone testifying on Sunday night, then the next Friday I'd see them out doing things they shouldn't have. And so I thought, oh, as long as you behave during church, you can do anything you want. <laughs> and so I really wrestled with it. And, and, and so, uh, of course, God <laughs> spanked me often. But, and, and so what happens is, is this is what we see is, is once I got through playing the game, the church game, then, then God became real. And God is here. And it became a relationship. He and I had a relationship. And, and I wanted our relationship to deepen and, and to grow close. And so before, even when I went to church, I didn't have that peace. I knew how to fake the joy. I knew how to do that, but I didn't have it. And, and so that's, that's, how, that's what God in my life means. It means that I'm whole. It means that I have a purpose. It means that I have a peace. And so tell, what has God done in your life? Maybe you struggle with something. Maybe you struggle with an attitude. Maybe you struggle with a vice. Maybe you struggle with an emptiness. Whatever it is, how has God helped you? And that's the important thing. When we're witnessing, we're, tell, we're telling people about the gospel. And the word gospel comes to us from the Greek word evangelion, evangelion, which means good news. So the gospel is good news. And it is, the gospel, the good news is Jesus died for us. And we can have, when we have a relationship with him, we're saved. And the gospel is something that should excite us. It, it's something that put, it should put a little pep in our step. See, we're, we're actually, we're privileged to share this gospel. I mean, we get the opportunity to talk about God with people. We get the opportunity to tell people, hey, you can be saved. You can have a peace. And this, this world, it amazes me. It, it constantly amazes me because everyone is searching so hard. I, I recently just read, uh, was reading a story about Miley Cyrus. And then now see that the, the Miley Cyrus that, that I knew was Hannah Montana. And for some of you, you don't have any clue what I'm talking about. But those were little ones. Or not anymore. But Hannah Montana was this cutie little girl that Billy Ray Cyrus's daughter, and everything always worked out. And my girls watch Hannah Montana 22 hours a day. 
And so then she kind of got into a young adult and just went crazy. I mean, she went crazy. And what's interesting is right now she's saying, I was out of my mind. She said, I, I was way out there. And it's interesting. She, and, of course, the world has to blame. So she said it was her dad's fault. Uh, she said it was her dad's fault. I was on Hannah Montana, so that's why I went wild. Well, now I'm becoming my own person. And, 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 but it's interesting, if you really listen to what she's saying, is, is she was trying to fill that God-sized hole in her heart. I hope you're, Miley, I hope you turn to YouTube and watch the Compassion Avenue Church God. Uh, but she was trying to fill that God-sized hole in her heart with, with money and fame when she was younger, and then that didn't fill it. So then she tried to fill it with... <laughs> Wild, and, and that didn't fill it, and so now she's kind of getting it. I'm still not, not got it, and, and until she comes to Jesus Christ, she won't. Nothing else will. Nothing else will fill that void, and so this is what. And it does. It's not just. We're not talking about a celebrity. These are people that you work next to. These are people you may live with. Every person is looking for something to fill that hole, and so when we tell them the good news, we said we can help you with that. So we're privileged. That's a privilege. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jews and Gentiles. So, the, and the word that I'm not ashamed, what that's talking about is, man, I'm excited. I, 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 and the, the Greek words that are there, are, they're phrased in a way that's saying, man, you couldn't hold me back. You, you couldn't force me to sit down and be quiet because I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am going to tell you about what Jesus did. I am going to tell you uh, about what he's done in, in my life. And so that's, that's, it's a privilege that we have. Now the Bible very plainly lets us know that we're responsible for sharing the gospel. The Bible doesn't merely hint at witnessing or it doesn't try to supply subtle clues. The Bible outlines what's expected of us. And if we don't bring the good news, who will? If we're not doing our part, others may not hear the good news. Romans 10, 14. How then can they call on the one they've not believed? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they not hear without someone preaching to them? Now, it would be wonderful if we, if we just had a magic light switch that turned the light on, and all of a sudden people said, the church light's on, let's flock to it. It would be wonderful if, if people said, I've got a problem, I've got to get to God. It would be wonderful. It's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, many times when people have problems, they say, well, I don't want to go to a church to add to my problems. And so what happens is we need to be taking the word out to them. You know, if you look historically uh, throughout our country, you know, our country has been has gone through ups and downs. But around the 40s and 50s especially, everybody gets religious during war time. So 1941 to 1945, when we were a praying nation. And then right after World War II, you see, because then we entered into uh, the Korean War in the uh, early 50s, and then we went out right to Vietnam in, in the 60s. And so what happened is our country at that time, there was a spiritual revival in the 40s and the 50s. And what happened was people did flock. And that's what, when I went to my first church, and most of them were older people in the very beginning, uh, when I went to the congregation, and what happened was they said, Pastor, all you got to do is put something on the sign and people will come. I put the catchiest, funniest, saddest, gravitous things and they didn't come. They used to. In the 40s and 50s, where were people on a Saturday night during a revival? The they were at the church. And where were they on Sunday morning? At the church. Well, and, and I believe historically, I believe the 60s where they start, you know, uh, tuning in and dropping out and getting high kind of thing, I think that uh, authority was questioned. And once you start taking authority away, every one of us has an authority over us. And, and, and it's God. And, um, and so when you take authority away, there's going to be problems. And, and because then you mess with absolutes. When you take authority, you don't have absolutes. When you don't have absolutes, you, you have nothing. And so what happened, and we see, is, is in, the, in the 60s, I believe that's where we start getting away. You know, when I first got into ministry 26 years ago, um, I spoke at a couple churches on two-week revivals. Now we can't, we've got to have three-day revivals because we can't get church people there. I, I mean, it's, it's realistic. I, I mean, uh, when I first 
started, they said, we want you to speak for two weeks. I was like, man, I don't know if I have know that much about God yet. And they're like, well, make it up. I said, all right. And, and so, um, hey, God God showed up every time, every night. Uh, praise the Lord. And so here, here's what we, we see is that the people are not, I said all that to say this, people are not just flocking to come into churches. And, and, and that's sad, but what that means is that means we got to go out. That means that we got to go out and our lives have to show it. There's a great Church of God song, Let a Holy Life Tell the Gospel Story. In other words, let our lives see where people say, there's something different about you. There's something going on. And then we need to be telling them that that difference is Jesus Christ. That difference is Him. So how can they believe if they've not heard? But what happens if they don't hear it respond to the gospel? Our job, now please hear this, our job is not to get them to respond. That's the Holy Spirit's work. Our job is to put it out there. Our job is to present it. It's up to the individual person whether or not he or she will accept. And when we know this fact, people see Jesus, they'll be moved. So when people really see Jesus, they'll be affected. John 12, 32, when I'm lifted high up on the earth, I will draw all people to me. When people see Christ in your life, in our life, in my life, it makes a difference. When, when people really see there is a light, and, and, and this is why I know I, I, I sound like I'm beating a, book, a, a dead horse, and I say, you know, smile, because folks, that we, there's enough grumpy, frumpy Christians out there. <laughs> There, there's enough church people that that scare me. Would, would you come visit my church? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh well, walk into that church. Man, they might grab you and beat you up or make you eat sour lemons. I mean, that's because that's how they look. And I, I'm not saying, you know, I'll just walk around, <laughs> everything's perfect. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm not saying that. But when we go and, and our lives are filled with that peace and that joy, it makes a difference. Because it does not matter what comes out of here. It matters what people see here. It matters what they see in your life. And so that's why I, I, I encourage us, you know, folks, live in a relationship with Christ. Uh, and we're not perfect, but live in that relationship with Christ where we're drawing closer and closer to Him. People will see that. We should know why we ask the Lord to come into our life. We should be able to articulate how we are saved. That's why we do the very first lesson, is salvation. What does it mean to be saved? How do we get saved? That's We start at the very beginning. The greatest witnessing is when it's coming from our hearts and it's real. <coughs> Too many times uh, people who attend church cannot tell others because they don't know themselves. Too many people come to church out of obligation or tradition or just kind of going through motions. When we're witnessing, we're obeying the mandates of Scripture and we're being the church. So this is why I have a question for you. Can you give the reason why you accepted Jesus Christ? And, and let me rephrase that. You should be able to give the reason why you accepted Jesus Christ. I've had a woman tell me, well, I don't know. I've always been saved. I said, when? She said, as soon as I was born. I said, uh-uh. Yeah. I know you are because you were, you were born into sin. For all sin falls short of glory, guys. And this woman who had been in church all I said, maybe I'm not saved. I said, well, let's do something about that. You should know that you're saved. You should know when. You should know why. And you've got to have a reason. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason of the hope that you have. So every one of us should be able to say, This is why I'm saved. If you'll ask me, and, and I don't have my pastor hat on, I'll say because C.J. Clogger, before he knew Jesus Christ, he, he, he looked, wanted to accomplish so much and, and believed that, that God was going to do something, but I didn't have that connection, so there was that emptiness. So the harder I worked, the more empty it was. And it wasn't until I said, okay, God, I'm yours, then God says, now I can start using you. <laughs> now I'll take over. And, and, and that's what I, I can name the time, I can name the date, I can name the place, I can name the area of sand that Janine and I were laying on, I, 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 can, I can see the dog next to us. I can tell you the car I drove. Because that was when, and, and all through my life, I've been in church all my life, so you know, I, I went to the altar a hundred times. But that night, that night, 27, 28 years ago, that night I said, you got everything. Everything. And I said, just one thing, Lord. Please don't let me be a pastor. <laughs> 
And, and, and then after, that, sun, that Sunday, Sunday is when a minister, Janine and I are walking into Pomona First Church of God, and there's an African American, Jerry Liddell, and he comes up to me. I never had seen him before. And he says, now that you're ready, I want to start training you. I said, who are you? He said, it doesn't matter. Every Friday we met, he made me memorize chapters, not verses, chapters. After one year, he said, I've taught you all I can, now you're going to go to seminary. I said, who are you? <laughs> he said, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And, and that's my journey. That's my journey. And, and so you, what is your journey? I mean, why did you come to the Lord? Why did you, why did you need him? What was going on? So here's what questions, and, and these are very important questions. Do you know that you're saved? First of all, do you know that you're saved? Why can you say, I am saved? And if you can't, go back to chapter 1. Go back to, to week 1, because we, that's what week 1 is all about. Uh, week 1 of the discipleship is, is go back. Make sure you know why you're saved. First step. Second step, day 2, our testimony. A partial definition of the word of testimony is a declaration by a witness. So a testimony can be brought forth in a court of law. The word testimony finds its root or origins in Latin where it literally means evidence. So our testimony is bringing evidence to light. That, that's why a, a testimony isn't just going on and on. A testimony is saying, this is something God has done. I, I've heard testimonies that were more of an emotional counseling instead of this is what God's doing. A testimony is saying, this is the truth, this is the evidence. And, and so to testify means eyewitnesses are going to recall what occurred and what's relevant. And they're going to provide their testimony so that others believe their side of the story. In a court of law, you have different forms of testimony to try to refute each other. Well, this is your testimony. This is the evidence in your life. So that's those Christians were to know our testimony. We're to know why we believe. If we're saved, there'll be a testimony. Something had to have happened somewhere or else we wouldn't have chosen to receive Christ. So it's important for us to share our testimonies. It's crucial for others to know to be impacted by our testimony or our evidence of God in our lives. So Jesus knew the most important, powerful ways of making a difference in people's lives is for them to hear what God has done. He knew when people heard of God's power and might and grace, they'd be impacted. So Jesus taught the disciples, tell what they've seen. In John 15, 27, and you also must testify, and they will must tell what they have witnessed. In other words, you know what Jesus said? Jesus says, you don't have to have all the, uh, the uh, hermeneutics and knowledge of the atonement. You don't have to have all that figured out. What have you seen? What has been going on in this last three years? So tell people. Well, Saul was a man whose sole existence was focused on, on ridding the earth of this new scourge called Christians. And he was obsessive. He was driven to accomplish his feat. And when he encounters Jesus, though, he's drastically changed. And not only is his heart different, but he's renamed Paul. He once was Saul, then he becomes Paul. And Paul's testimony is powerful, and he wanted others to understand. So we give a testimony, Acts 26, 13. It says about, and he's talking to a man named King Agrippa. And he says, about noon, King Agrippa, I was on the road. I saw light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. So Paul was saying, man, I was, I was out to kill Christians. I was heading up to Damascus to get them. And all of a sudden, boom, about noon, the light came out. And I was struck blind, scales on my eyes, the whole thing. And so basically, Paul is just saying, what happened? He's just saying, what's going on? Our testimony doesn't just have to be about when we were saved. For say we can testify or share what God is doing lately. That's one reason why I pound you all. Where are you seeing God? Where are you seeing God? Where, where is he at? He, and God is everywhere. And so when we share with others uh, what Jesus is doing, it will cause them to think about what God is doing. God is working in everyone's lives. But people have trained themselves not to see God. Or they have harden themselves not to see God. But God is always working everywhere with everyone. But too often we miss it. So when we testify to others that Jesus is working, it reminds us God is alive and well. So we're to testify what God is doing right now. Acts 10.28, then this is Peter. Peter said, you know, you're well aware it's against our law for Jew to associate or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me I shouldn't call anyone impure or unclean. 
You know what, Peter? Peter was having a tough time. Because God at first tells him in Acts 10, 14, go, go kill and eat. In other words, I want you to connect with them. And he says, I ain't doing it. I'm not going to do it. But what we see is, is Peter is saying, hey, God's kind of doing some things in my life. God's kind of cleaning me up a little bit. God's kind of changing my thinking. So tell people what God is doing. Tell people what God is, is, is convicting you of. Tell people what God is drawing you closer. Tell people where you see a new way of God. And, and, and so when we tell that, that people, they may disagree with us, they may mock us, but you know what, that's going to resonate in their mind. When we share our testimonies, we're privileged to be sharing about God. When we testify, we're not merely glibly verbalizing something or letting words solely fall from our lips. We're talking about God. When we testify, we can experience the presence of God. Our personal testimonies not only encourage, but they can encourage us. Our personal testimony is an anchor to hold when, when we encounter the raging winds of a, bro of a brutal storm. And, and that's what I, I want to encourage you, is when we get to talk about what God's done in our life, that, that is so neat. It, 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 it's so incredible. So when we know our testimony, we'd be blessed. Acts 4.33, with great power, the, uh, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. So as they're telling about Jesus is alive, that just gave them a power. And the more that we know our testimony, the more we share our testimony, the more it'll, it'll pound in us. And, and so this is so important to, to know our testimony and to, and to be sharing it. So how can we articulate our testimony? What should we say or write? Our testimony is what has God done? What, how has he changed us when we, when we first met him? Our testimony is how we entered into a relationship with Jesus. Our testimony is where we share where we're at and where God brought us. It, it, our testimony is it's, it's talking about what happened when you met God. What happened when you came to Him. And that's why we don't have to be a published author or a world-renowned speaker to have a testimony. We just got to meet God. Once we meet God, we have a testimony. There's evidence of what's in our life. I love John 9.25. Pastor, you say you love a lot of verses. I do. I just like the Bible. And so what's incredible is in John 9.25, a man who's hanging out, the disciples first try to make this man an argument. Okay, Jesus, which who sinned, him or his parents? And Jesus says, uh-uh, it had nothing to do with sin. It has to do about the glory of God. And the disciples are going, yeah, well, we knew that. You know, they didn't know what was going on. Jesus heals him. And, and you know what? Then the Pharisees are like, Jesus is the devil. He's the devil. And, and so Jesus is like, it doesn't make any sense. And so then they go after the guy. And they say, say tell, tell us that, that Jesus is the devil. And you know what the man says? Is he says, John 9, 25, I don't know if the guy's a sinner or not. I don't know. But one thing I know, I was once blind. And now what? I see. Now I see. You see? That's all you got to do. That is the perfect testimony. Well, okay, exactly at what time did Jesus come to earth? I don't know. How exactly did the Holy Spirit impregnate Mary? I don't know. It wasn't there. When exactly did the disciples do this? I don't know. But I know when I met Jesus that there was a hole here and he filled that. Amen. <laughs> this guy says, I don't even know if he's a sinner or not. <laughs> but I do know this. I once was blind, now I can see. And so that's what I want to encourage us to do. Is that's, that's your testimony. What happened before you knew Jesus? How, how did you come in to know him? Our testimony can also be brought uh, about how God brought us through a tough time. It'd be a time that God's blessed us. And our testimony is ongoing. God doesn't stop being God when we get saved. Once we enter into a relationship with God, He didn't just become a couch potato. He's still working, and He's taking care of us. So our testimony means that God is still working. Philippians 4.12, I like this. I know what it's like to be in need. I know what it's like to be plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or whether living in plenty or want. And, of course, the next verse says, the secret is, I can do what? Oh, All things goodness. through Christ. It's crucial to understand that our testimony is not just spoken or written. Our testimony is lived. Our testimony is witnessed. And it can come out of our words, it can come out, it comes out in our words or actions, but our lives can be great testimonies or terrible ones. So it doesn't matter what we say if people see contradictions in our lives. So please remember, our lives are the testimonies. It's very easy to say this. You know, a lot of time when I do marriage counseling, people say, well, I love, I love my wife. I love my husband. I'll say, then you do this for them. Well, I'm not going to do that. Then you don't love them. You don't love them. If you're not willing to do something, if you're not willing to die for them, husbands, you know, us husbands, we like to beat you women up. Ephesians 5.25, well, I just submit to your husband. I think that's the only verse most guys learn as they're growing up. <laughs> and, uh, and so they pound them in that. 
Uh, why, you woman, you got to submit. But we always forget Ephesians 5.26, which says, Husbands, love your wives like Christ loves the church. He died. And this is what I tell men. Your wife will submit to you when you die to her. Ooh, it's awfully quiet in here, but it's that's biblical. And and so what happens is is that's what remember our lives are testimonies. Colossians three twenty two, slaves obey your earthly masters in everything. Wow. In everything we are to obey, and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity, heart, and reverence for the Lord. And it goes on the next verse to talk about because what we do we're doing for the Lord. We're working for the Lord. So on day two, oh, I'm never going to get through this lesson. Day two, write out your personal testimony. So write out your personal testimony. And this is very important. Of how many of you have actually, don't, don't get mad, Chuck. You don't have to do this. He, oh, oh. Well, let me, tell you, let me tell you my testimony before you go. He said no one. <laughs> All right. How many of you have, have written out your testimony? Uh, a few. So I want to encourage you to go back and do it again. Go back and do it again. And if you, I hope you still have it. Um, I, my testimony is all written out. And one thing I do is I tell ministers, write out your call into the ministry. Because there's times when, when you are going to want to do anything else than be a pastor. And there's no times that you pull out that call and you read it and you say, I don't have a choice. And um, I have it in, in my left drawer. I always have. Uh, and... I haven't had Ash Avenue, but there's times when I pulled that dude out and thought, man, I, I should have. Anyway, uh, so, but write out your personal testimony. Write it out. And, and, and then write a testimony of what God's doing in your life now. How is he blessing you? How is he challenging you? How are you growing? And, and, and this is, when you do that, that's when you realize where you're at spiritually. Because really, it's hard to gauge where we're at spiritually. Physically, we know where we're at. We step on scales, we tell where we're at. We go to the doctor, we get our numbers, our blood work, we tell where we're at. Emotionally, you can really kind of tell where you're at. But spiritually, the only way really to tell where you're at is to tell where you've been. And so what I want to encourage you to do is write out what God is doing in your life. Okay. Um, oh, we, we forgot the, 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 like I said, this lesson is so good. We forgot the memory verses. Uh, the memory verse is a, is a good one. John 12, 32, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men to myself. It's only one line long. I know, I know. And, and, but then you've got to write out the first 33 books of the Bible. 33 books, halfway there. It's like 66 books. We're halfway there. Think about that. So uh, hang in there. So, all right. Well, day three, there are obstacles to witnessing. And if witnessing and, and, and is only telling us about God and what he's done, then that really should be basic. We should all be doing it. Absolutely. But there's a lot of things that hinder us. There's obstacles that are placed in our path. Now, we're not giving the enemy any credit, but we do have to remember he doesn't want us to share our, the good news. He doesn't want people to hear it. And so he'll do everything and anything he can to prevent us from witnessing. So it's important to recognize the obstacles and snares that prevent us. Once we identify what blocks us, then we can overcome them. So the first obstacle to being a witness or having power of testimony, if there's no evidence of God in our lives, if people don't see somewhere God in our life, and, and a great, great, great test is Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against these there's no such law. How are you doing with those things? Those, those are kind of a great test. Philippians 4, 8, 9 is a good one. Think about that, which is lovely, pure, admirable, uh, praiseworthy. And, and, and think about those. How are we doing with that? If we're not where we should be with the Lord, that will directly affect our witness. If we don't have a healthy relationship, well, I'm glad you came back, brother. I, I, thank you, brother. I, I, was, I, I was hurt. Uh, uh, now I'm whole. Uh, if we don't have a healthy relationship with God, then how can we share others? So this is, please hear this. If there is sin in our lives, we cannot witness or give a testimony about the Lord. Because if there's sin in our lives, how are we telling someone they can be saved? If I'm on fire, I can't put you out of fire. That's why I've shared with you all before. Why, you know, I go to the gym, and, and it always seems guys in worse shape than me, these big chunky guys, well, this is how you do the weight. I'm like, don't tell me. <laughs> you can't tell me how to get in shape if you're not in shape first. And, and, and so here, here's what we do. If there's sin in our lives, how can we help someone else? 
Isaiah 59, 2, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so he will not hear. If a person is a sinner, that's why some and, and, and we gotta be we've got to tell be honest with people. A lot of times people who don't have a relationship with God say, I pray all the time. No, you can't. That's not prayer, because God does not hear the prayer of a sinner except for the prayer of repentance. And that's there's uh, five verses that, have, that specifically say that if there's sin in our, high, our life, that God does not hear us. Psalm 66, 18 is another one. And so here we see is that it flat out says that, that if there's sin in our life, we first, before we can talk about it, we first need to say, Lord, forgive me. And so our witness will be blocked at that. So if there's sin in our lives, we need to repent and rely on the Holy Spirit. Then we can tell others how God forgave. Another obstacle in many states is that they're afraid. Well, what if people that we talk about God, what if they think that we're different? What happens if they're still, if we're still in wall or they think that we're odd? Uh, that's so many of what is that run through our mind. And before we know, we're paralyzed by fears, and we find ourselves infected. So when you're in a relationship with God, you don't have to be afraid. See, fear stops us from witnessing. Fear halts us from, from talking about God. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, For the Spirit God gave us did not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and discipline. And so again, rely upon God. Rely upon Him. Don't let fear... Don't let, well, I don't want to be thought of as, as a Jesus freak. That's okay. I don't want to be thought of as a Bible thumper. That, that's all right. Who cares? Yeah, who cares? I don't. Yeah, and, and too many times fear kind of blocks us from that. Well, people won't like you. Let me tell you what, if someone won't like you because you're a Christian, they wouldn't have liked you when you weren't a Christian. And, and so that's what we need to understand is, is that sometimes fear stops us. Judging others or thinking we're better than them is an obstacle to our testimonies. If we think we're better than others, we're forgetting that we're, they're one of God's creations the same as we are. When we stereotype or, or assign people a certain identity, we miss out on sharing good news. So we're also hurting ourselves because we could be missing out on a beautiful friendship or relationship. So if we judge others, we can't witness to them. John 1.46, uh, uh, Phil, uh, Nathaniel said, Nazareth, can anything good, good come from Nazareth? Uh, Nathaniel asked and Philip said, come and see. I love this. Philip didn't say, Philip didn't argue with him. Philip didn't say, you gotta, you got to understand. Philip said, just come and see. Come here and see. And I want you to see that Jesus is a real thing. And so sometimes we see someone say, oh, they're, they're a dirty, rotten, scoundrel sinner. They'll never come to the Lord. Ah, be careful. Those dirty, rotten, scoundrel sinners can be the best Christians in the world and great witnesses. And so sometimes we're, 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 we judge people. Well, they don't think like this or they don't act like this or, or look like us. And so we, we don't want to witness to them. You, you know well, witness to them. Witness to them because God will do some incredible things. Well, when we think more of ourselves, that also blocks us from witnessing. If we feel we don't deserve what we have uh, to share, then we're hurting ourselves. The, the worship pastor at my last church, he gave me this definition of pride and, and I had to... I said, I'm going to give you credit. And so uh, I gave him credit, and he came up with this definition. And he said this, pride is self-exaltation at someone else's expense. Isn't that fancy? <laughs> yeah, that was so good, I couldn't even claim that one. Man, that's, that's, that's kind of rude. And, and so what, what we see is, is when we are lifting ourselves up and lowering someone else, that pride is coming in. That pride is causing us to rise. Pride causes us to lose sight of not only God, but our true connection to others. Every one of us is equal. There is no one any better or any worse. So, oh, there's some worse people out there. No, when you were in sin, you were as bad as they were. Amen. And you know what? The only difference between you and them is that you're forgiven. And, and so never forget that. But pride, you know, oh, we're good church people. Uh, it's not about that. Don't let pride get in your way. And pride stops witnessing. James 4, 6, but he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So we can be afraid to witness because we think we're going to be rejected. What if we share our testimony and they think we're weird? What happens if we talk to someone about our relationship with God and they think we're snobs or hypocrites or losers? We're created to be in community and it hurts us to be excluded. But we don't like when we're not liked. Let's, let's be honest. Not, unless you're a, a sadist masochist, every one of us wants to be liked. And, and, and so we've, we've got to understand that. It doesn't feel good when others don't care for us. But here's the truth. Not everyone is going to like us. And, and that's hard for us. It's hard for us as people. You know, I'll tell people, I say, I don't know why you don't like me. I'm a great guy. 
<laughs> and, and so that is, is tough, but not everyone's going to accept us. And so sometimes we're afraid to witness because we think that we're going to miss out on an incredible blessing. When we're scared to be rejected by others, it affects our testimony. Look at the Ezekiel 2.6. It says, You son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid of them, though briars and thorns are all around you and live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified. They are rebellious people. You know what God was telling Ezekiel? Don't be afraid of what they can do to you. Don't be afraid of what they can threaten you. Don't be afraid of what they're going to say. You keep being my kid. You keep witnessing. You keep telling them. And how true that is. So, so yes, we're going to be rejected. But you know what? Even when we weren't Christians, we were rejected, right? I, I mean, think about it. We forget about that. But remember, it's better to be received by Christ than embraced by Him. Then, then it's better to have that than just to rely upon our, our wanting to be liked and, and not be rejected. So let's remember that we're, we're seeking to, to have Him, him uh, wrap around us. Well, another obstacle that detracts people from witnessing is a fear they don't have enough knowledge to witness. This is probably the biggest one that I see. It's too many times people say, well, I just don't know what to say. I, I don't know enough of the Bible. I don't know enough of this. And so what if I, I don't know the answer to the question? What if someone asks me about the Levitical duties of a priest and I don't know? That's okay. <laughs> that person won't believe anything else I have to say. See, we worry and concern ourselves about what we don't know more than we realize how much we do know. The main bulk of our testimony is not based on our grasp of biblical knowledge. It's on our God knowledge. Simply tell people about what God's done in your life. Jesus pointed out to Nicodemus, he was lying on the wrong knowledge. I love this. In John 3.10, uh, Nicodemus said, you've got to be born again. What are you talking about? And Jesus said, you're Israel's teacher. And you don't understand this? In other words, Jesus was kind of slamming Nicodemus saying, ah, you're trying to rely on all of that when I'm just trying to tell you you just got to be born again. You see, sometimes we get it so, so we make it so complicated. Here is the gospel. Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you. And if you'll confess your sins to him and believe in your heart, Romans 10, 9, and if you will live a life in a relationship with him, that's all right. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. All of us know that. And so, and what has he done in your life? So let's remember, living how we live can obstruct the effectiveness and power of our testimony. If we're not walking what we're talking, it'll be apparent. Our words must match our actions, and which must match our hearts. All of these must match God. So the greatest testimony is a godly life. So let's live our lives so it doesn't take away from our witness. 1 Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But look at this, set an example for the believers in speech, in our words, in conduct, how we act, in love, in faith, and in purity. And so our lives, our lives will tell the whole lot. They tell everything. So let's be real. And this is between you and God. Is there anything blocking our witness? Is there anything that we talk about? Is it maybe a fear of being rejected? Maybe it's a fear of we don't know what to say. Maybe there's something in our heart we've not turned over to God. Uh, whatever it is, is there anything blocking our, hint, our witness, hindering our witness? What are we going to do about it? And I ask that question with, not a rhetorical uh, when we get around to it, but what are you going to do about it? Whatever is holding you back, give that to God. Give that to Him. Day four, approaches to witnessing. There's many ways of witnessing and sharing our faith. And we've mentioned some of them before. But today and tomorrow in our study, we're going to be looking at practical and applicable ways. So I'm going to give you some nuts and bolts. This is, this is, is, is the practical stuff to do. So when we've learned we're supposed to witness, so I, I, please, I please, please hear, every Christian is to be telling their testimony. Every Christian is to be telling others about God. Every Christian. And so now we're going to examine how can we do this. Not every approach will work with every person. We are all created unique and, and different. And one approach may reach someone while, while someone else, while another approach, approach, a approach may repel them. So something's going to work with some person and it's going, to, it's going to push someone else off. Now there's different approaches that will gravitate to and feel comfortable. There will be other approaches that we don't feel comfortable and we don't believe it would be effective. And that's okay. Where are you at? Each one of us are different. We need to discover which approach approaches for us and, and, and is the best one for us. Not witnessing is not an approach. <laughs> I, some people will say, well, I'm not very good at any of the approaches. Yes, you are. You've got to find which one. 
and, and, and there's others. So, and when we don't witness, we are disobeying God. The first approach, so we're going to look at several approaches. The first approach is called confrontational. Now, confrontational witnessing doesn't mean overly aggressive or pushy. So confrontational witnessing does not mean that you take your Bible and you hit them over the head. That's not confrontational, that's assault. <laughs> and so what we do is, is what it is is confrontational is laying out facts. And it, it, it's what needs to take place. So confrontational witnessing will work with someone who's a matter-of-fact person. And, and they need a line to be drawn. You know, I, I had a man come to me and, and he uh, uh, said, you know, I believe there's a God, I believe this, I believe that, and... And uh, I said, so what's stopping you from accepting him, from turning your life over to him? He goes, well, really, there, there's nothing. I said, well, then you know what? Stop talking about it and do it. He said, when? I said, right now. So that's confrontational witnessing. If someone needs a line. Because you know what? We will talk around the bush forever. Mm -hmm. You know, when people are turned 15, they'll get saved when they're 16. When they're 16, they'll get saved when they're 21. When they're 21, they'll get saved when they're 25. When they're 25, they'll get saved. Uh, confrontational witnessing is to do it right now. Now, confrontational witnessing, that may not be for everyone. And they may feel pressure. Remember, not every approach works for every person. And uh, remember, uh, remember that. Not every approach. Um, I, I am a more, uh, hopefully, come off as lovingly confrontational. Is, is, uh, but that's, that's me. Not everyone is like that, but there's times when we do have to be like that. And so confrontational witnessing is putting it right in front of someone saying, make a decision. And, and when I, I have to witness to someone like this, I'll say, no, if you don't make a decision, that's making a decision. If you say, I'll get saved later, then that's your making a decision not to come to the Lord. Acts 2.38, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter was saying, do it right now. Right now, repent and be baptized. So confrontational witnessing, is, it's, it's, not, it's not up in your face screaming or yelling. But what confrontational witnessing is saying, make a decision. And a lot of people, they know all the facts. But they've not had someone say, do it. Draw, draw the line. All right. Number two, intellectual witnessing is presenting facts, figures, and evidence. So there's intellectual witnessing. Acts 17, 22, Paul stood up in the media of the Arabicus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you're religious. So what Paul said is, is Paul said, I want to reason with you. So intellectual witnessing is for someone who wants facts. They want figures. They want evidence. And, and this is where you talk about the stars. This is where you talk about the order of the universe. It's incredible. Scientists say there's an intelligent design, but they won't say there's a God. <laughs> and, and so what you do is you just you prove the facts. There's a lot of resources and things. And, and uh, Josh McDowell, Josh McDowell uh, uh, basically was a, a young man in his, his uh, doctoral thesis. He was going, his doctoral project was to disprove God. And so what he did is he traveled the world, traveled to Israel, traveled to Europe, traveled the world, trying to disprove God. Everything he found proved God. And so he came to be a Christian, and he wrote a great book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And then he wrote a second volume of it, More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And so if you've got someone that says, well, I need the facts, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell, I mean, he just, he literally was trying to disprove God. And everything he found proved God. He was like, oh, I hate that. And, and so eventually he comes to know the Lord. So maybe you know someone who's got, who, give me the facts, figures, and evidence. And they'll, they'll always throw up, you know, well, why are bad things happening? Or, you know, a lot of times when people will say, well, why, why is, you know, how, how can you have a Hitler if there's a, a God? I'll say, you can't have a Hitler if, there, if you don't have a God. Because if you don't have, Hitler was the absolute evil, if you don't have a God who's absolute good, then absolute evil would be normal. And that's, that's what I, I want people to see. Is, is that's how you have to talk intellectually with someone. Is you can't just say, well, just believe it, because they're not going to. So you've got to prove the facts. This is a powerful one. Testimonial witnessing is where you're telling others about what you've seen, about where you witness God in your lives. We're letting them know God is real because we've seen God move. 
We know for a fact God exists because we have proof in our life. Testimony witnessing is personal and may not work for everything because we experience things different, but it's very effective if you're sincere. So personal, personal testimony is, is, again, that gets back to knowing your testimony. Testimonial witnessing is just saying, hey, this is where I was at. Man, I was working hard, making great money, but you know what? Every, every dime I made, uh, it, didn't, it didn't empty the thing. Every car I got, I still had that emptiness. Every job promotion I got, I still knew I was missing something. But when I came to Jesus, you know what? I have a peace. I have a wholeness. So John 9, 21, it gets, this gets back to the blind man. But he could see now, who, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for himself. You see, because the Pharisees went to the parents, and they're like, tell us about your kid. What dirt can we get on your kid? And they said, ask him himself. So testimonial witnessing is, what has God done in your life? What, how God has God moved? Now, interpersonal witnessing is when we're connecting and interacting directly with an individual. We're taking time to be with them. We're getting to know them. We're letting them know our hearts and getting to know their hearts. Interpersonal witnessing doesn't normally take place overnight. It takes a while to connect and enter into someone's world. A great way to witness interpersonally with people is to find common ground. Find something each of you are interested in and pursue it while waiting for opportunities to talk to the Lord. There was a, a man that, uh, in Illinois that he and I went fishing for a long time. And it was funny because after about four or five months of fishing, he turned to me and he says, you know what? He says, I'm kind of mad at you. I said, you are? Why is that? And he says, you're a preacher. I said, yeah. And he says, you don't talk to me about God. I said, okay. He says, I need God. I says, I know. He says, well, then talk to me about God. And so there on the lake, I led him to the Lord. And I'll tell you what, if I would have done that the first day, he would have never gotten to a boat. If I would have done it the second month, he would have never gotten to a boat. But what happened is he got to know me. And, and that's why when I got a hook caught in my finger, and yes, even us good fishermen do that every now and then. Not Tom, <laughs> but I do every now and then. And, uh, and you know what? That's why I went, Ugh. And he said, oh, are you going to cuss? I'm like, I want to. <laughs> I really do. But I can't because God won't let me. And he laughed. We're all cuss for you. Okay. <laughs> so interpersonal relationship is, is you're just getting to know someone. And, and most people, again, I, it, it ha it's happened time after time. Most people say, aren't you witnessing to me? And I'm thinking, Yeah. I am, but you don't know it. And, and so that's a great, great way. So it's meeting a person where we're at. Luke 5, 4, when, they, when Jesus finished speaking, he said to Simon, put it to the deep water and let the nets down for a catch. Because remember, they had been out, they hadn't caught anything all night. Jesus met them where they were at. They were in the boats. Go out a little bit farther. Put out, boom. And so you may be interpersonally witnessing. That's why I remember your witness. Remember, when they're complaining about something, don't jump in because you're witnessing. You don't have to complain with them. Make sure that, that uh, you know, you're, you're telling them, yeah, that's a tough situation, and I get through it by prayer, or I get through it because I know God's here. So you, you can do those kind of things, but if, you're, if they don't see a difference between you and them, why should they come to know Jesus? Invitational witnessing is when we're inviting someone and we're offering them to come somewhere where they'll hear the gospel. When we invite to someone to church, uh, we're witnessing to them with this approach. And it doesn't necessarily need to be religious. We can invite them to our homes or a movie or a sporting event. Then during that time, we invite them to meet Jesus. Now, this approach, this is different than confrontational because a person doesn't need to make a decision at this time, but they have time to process it and choose whether or not. And, and so invitational is, is when we're basically inviting, we're saying, you know what? It would be good for you to come to know the Lord. Or, I know God would fill that hole in your heart. And that's kind of invitational. You, you, you do it where you spend time with them, you kind of invite them in. In John 4, 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So what happened is, is remember the woman at the well? She goes back, tells the Samaritan people. They come back. Not everyone got saved. But many, many did. So invitational is when you, you, you say, hey, would you like to know the Lord? And, and this is why I want to encourage you sometime. Uh, you all can, can maybe you're, you're in, in the sanctuary and you see someone that the Holy Spirit is talking to. There is nothing wrong with saying, would you like me to come pray with you? 
Or is there anything I can pray about? You don't even have to bring them to the altar. They may not even feel comfortable doing that. But that's invitationals where you are basically inviting them. You're basically connecting with them. And they may not at that time. They may not, but you're, you're offering it. Well, there's an approach to witnessing that doesn't even include words. We can witness to people through serving them. When we do something for nice for something for someone else, it impacts them. When we give, especially when we're not demanding, we can make a great difference. There's countless people who come to the Lord because they were served in some manner. How many of us came to the Lord because in some way, somewhere, someone served in some manner? Probably most of us, or a lot of us, someone served. Could have been an old Sunday school teacher. Could have been an old driver who picked us up and took us to church. Could have been someone that, that was always there for us. And so serving is very, very important. When we serve others, it's a phenomenal witness. Acts 9.36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. She was always doing good and helping the poor. You see, by her life, people saw God. Well, then the last approach is relational witnessing is connecting with someone on a deep level. Witnessing to someone as we've had a, a relationship is powerful. If we have a relationship with them, we'll be able to speak in their lives. We may be able to ask them hard questions. And, and this is, is very, very close to interpersonal witnessing, but it's a lot deeper. And like interpersonal witnessing, relational witnessing is not going to take place overnight. When we first build a relationship with someone, we're making a statement. We value you. And you're not just a number to get people saved, quote. Relational witnessing is where we're real with each other, to be honest. So relational witnessing is where we're spending a lot of time with people to show them Christ. That's one of the challenges of the church. As soon as we get saved, we surround ourselves with only uh, uh, Christians. And so, again, now you're saying, aren't you going to contradict yourself because you tell us all the time, if I'm with someone that's causing me to look away from God, not to spend time with them? Yes. If you're looking to someone that is affecting your relationship with God, you should be spending time with them. But we need to be spending time with the unsaved. We need to be spending time with people who don't know the Lord. And, and the reason is, is because they need to see the Lord in us. It, it's fascinating. That, you know, you all know I'm a history nut. And, and um, you know, I, when we first moved here, went through the pen. And, and I fell in love with the history of it. And so I thought, oh, I'd love to do tours. This would be just fun. And, and so, boom, doing it. And, and what's incredible is I actually had a woman on a tour. And we had people that were coming late into it. So I didn't do my normal spiel. So I didn't get through the pastor thing. But the very end of the tour, I said, I forgot to tell you in the, in the very beginning, I forgot to tell you I was a pastor. I'm sorry, I, I meant to tell you that in the beginning. And a woman said, she said, about halfway through the tour, she said, I knew you were a Christian. And I thought, huh? And I said to her, how? She said, you have a joy. And I said, I'm talking about people killing each other. <laughs> she said, yeah, but you're enjoying it. <laughs> she didn't say that. She didn't say that. Look, but, and, it, and it hit me. It, it really hit me. Remember, it, it is when you have that relational witnessing, be who you are. Be who you are. Mark 5, 19. Uh, there's a man who remember uh, the garrison demoniac who got saved, and he said, I want to come with you. And Jesus said this. Jesus didn't let him come. But he said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done. Go home. Tell people. And that's what relational witnessing. So, what approach or approaches helped you come to Christ? Was it the confrontational? Boom. Come and get saved. Was it the invitational? Hey, think about coming to the Lord. Was it the interpersonal where someone spent some time with you? Was it the intellectual? Someone proved? How did you come to the Lord? I mean, what approach worked with you? And then... What approach are you are you are approaches are you comfortable with? What do you do well? What 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 do you what just feels right? And then here is where we start getting tougher. Write down the names of three people you're going to witness in the next month. Three people you are going to witness to in the next month, and what approach are you going to use? And again. As I've always told you about one step closer, you get out of it what you put into it. If you do this, statistically, you'll see one of these people come to the Lord. Now, do you have three friends that don't know Jesus? And do you want them to come to know Jesus? Do that. Do that. All right. Day five. Oh, don't look at the clock. Day five. Yes. Pastor, 
Okay. <laughs> I knew this was going to be a long, this is an exciting one. It's not required until August. All right. Witnessing day five. This is a powerful way. So what we've done in day four, we've just given you some kind of approaches. And of course, I've just given you a thumbnail sketch of what things, volumes of books are written on on each approach. But this gives you kind of the idea. But uh, day five is a Romans road. How many of you are familiar with the Romans road? Couple, okay. Romans road is a great way. It's not always perfect. It doesn't always. It's not always cut, uh, cookie cutter, but it does work. So the Romans road, it's a path to lead people through scripture verses uh, through the book of Romans, and and it's kind of some questions. It's kind of to anticipate some questions. And a man named Jack Kyle stated he developed it, and that's kind of if, <laughs> he might have, uh, but uh, he was in the Hammond First Baptist Church. In Hammond, Indiana. And that church, when he went to that church, it had less than 100, but in several years it had about 30,000. And what he did was, Jack Hiles was Mr. Busman. He developed the bus ministry. And so they would send buses all through Hammond, Gary, Indiana, and bring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids to church. And so that, that goes back to the 60s and 70s. Well, it, Roman Trump could be tough at first. But it really is easy. And so here, here's kind of what happens. When, when I'm witnessing with someone, they will, a lot of questions, why do I need to be saved? Why do I need a Savior? I mean, why? And then we reply with Romans 3.23. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us had sinned. We were born into sin. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Get that out of your mind. <laughs> well, I, I didn't do anything. You're exactly right. All of us were born. All of us were born into sin. And if they say, I don't agree with that, say, have you been around a two-year-old? <laughs> a two-year-old is sin incarnate. What is the only word a two-year-old knows? No. No. Or mine. Or give me. And, and so um, we've all sinned and fallen short in the glory of God. And so... A lot of times, you know, we tell we need a Savior because we're born with sinful nature. Jesus was the final sacrifice that we sin. Another question, then, well, why sin back? I mean, it seems as if a lot of people are sinning. Does it make a difference if, sin, if we sin or not? Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life. And so that's what we need to tell them is, is yes, very sadly, most pe many people in the world are sinning, but there is, a, there is death. And that is, means eternal separation from God. See, sin is bad and it separates us. We were created by God to have a relationship with Him. And if there's sin in our lives, it severs that. So if we're choosing to sin, we're choosing to reject God and be dead forever. And so if we choose to receive the gift of God, we'll have eternal life. And then a question may come up, well, why does God care for me? I mean, why would God care for my eternity? We can reply with Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates His love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you no matter what. And this is where I, if I'm using the Romans Road, this is where I pound the fact, God loves you. And, and, and we get, well, I don't deserve that love. You're right. Well, I can't earn that love. You're right. But God loves you. And God not only cares for us, but God loves all that is his. And he gave his only son to die for us. God loves us and we don't deserve it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. God's demonstration of love is that Jesus did. And so then they could ask the question, what do I have to be saved? Romans 10, 9. And you know that verse. That if you confess with your mouth, what? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Lord. And believe in your heart. He was raised from the dead. And you will be saved. That's why we start off with Romans 10, 9. That's it. And, and so now, remember... Getting saved is not just saying a prayer. Getting saved is entering into a relationship. And that's, that's why we draw closer to God. So then a person says, well, well, how do I know if I'm saved? In the Romans 5, 1, it says, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a faith. Faith is believing when it doesn't make sense. Faith is hanging on even though we can't rationalize it. And so you said, did you believe that prayer? That's why when I lead someone to the Lord, I'll say, did you believe that prayer? Did you mean that prayer? Then what you're doing is you're saying, I am entering into a relationship with God. I'm entering into a connection with Him. 
And when we do that, we are saved. So we can know we're saved by faith. We can believe we're saved because God promises He wants us to have a relationship. He welcomes us. We can also know we're saved when we have a peace that we don't understand. We talk about the God-sized hole, and that hole's God. What about all the bad things I did? Will God really forgive me? Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there's no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is what's so beautiful, is that when we are forgiven, we are forgiven. When God forgives us, it's gone. Something many Christians wrestle with is forgiving themselves. And when we wrestle with that, we're telling God that he didn't forgive us. So we are actually slamming God when we don't forgive us. But you don't know what bad things I did. No, I don't, but I know God forgave you. And if God forgave you, then how dare we pick it back up? If God forgave us, who makes us saying that we should still feel bad? You know what we're doing? We're saying we're bigger than God. It's a tough one for us as Christians. We, we like to, to beat ourselves up. Let the it go. The stinking devil makes you remember. The stinking thinking of the devil. And what you do is you say, no, I've been forgiven. It's gone. It's, it's you know, I get verses uh, cast as far as for the east is from the west, Psalms 103, 12. You know, I, all those verses. So it's, it's, it's gone. So when we ask for forgiveness of our sins, God promises he'll forgive us and forget our sins. And so then what if a person says, what, what does it mean that I'm saved? And then you tell them this, Romans 8, 38, 39, I'm convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, height or depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So when we're saved, we are never separated from him. We are in that relationship with him. We are connected with Him. And you know what in a relationship? Think about your human relationships. You, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I believe that God gives us marriage for, for the opportunity to, to learn more about God because there's times when, when my wife, she loves me with, uh, with all of her heart, but there's times she just doesn't like me. <laughs> and that's hard to believe because I'm a great guy. I know, I know. And I'll tell her, I'll say, she'll say, I, I love you and I would die for you. She said, but go in another room. <laughs> you're, you're like killing me. And, and you know, of course, my spiritual gift is I'm on your last nerve. I want to step on harder. And, and, and so, you know, this is, this is the thing. Relationship, even, even human relationships, we're going to get on each other's nerves. Mm -hmm. But you know, we keep loving each other. <laughs> and we keep learning and growing together. And there's going to be times God, that's why God has a flat head. Did you see what they did now? <laughs> oh, not really. But there's times when we will frustrate God. But He loves us. And there's times we, we're like, God, we can't figure this out. And we can get frustrated. But that's where we still, no matter what, like what Job said in 3825, no matter if you slay me, still I will follow. And so that's why I want us to hang on. Never forget how much you're loved. When we're saved, we're realizing and embracing the love of God. God is love. We were created to be loved by Him. We were created to connect with Him. So, do you want to receive that love? Do you want a relationship with God? So the Romans road is actually pretty confrontational. Remember the approaches? Because it really is kind of, here's it. And it's, it's intellectual as well. It, it, it kind of says, here's facts. And now make a decision. And there may be other questions, and the Romans road is not perfect. If you, if you memorize all those verses and wait, okay, ask me the questions. <laughs> They're going to ask you a different question. <laughs> That's where you're like, oh, I don't know. But let's Ooh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that, I, I, in, in Ohio, a young man, uh, he, he was a mess. He a great, great young guy and, uh, in mid-30s, and he, he, was, he was a mess. He was a mess. And he came to know the Lord, and man, he was on fire. And, and he'd call me in the middle of the night and say, Pastor, i got to go talk to someone about Jesus. I'm like, it's not me. It's not me. <laughs> go find someone else. And, and, and I'm like, go get on the street, man. Let me sleep. And he, he's like, give me witnesses. Give me scriptures of witness. So I'd give him a bunch. So he'd call me, man, I, I just got, about got this guy coming to the Lord, but he asked me this question. And I said, just say you don't know. I can do that? <laughs> yeah. That's Okay. Tell him what you do know. And, and uh, Paul, <laughs> I love Paul. Um, <laughs> and so, 
you know, the Romans wrote isn't perfect, but it's a good template. It's a good template. Now some tough questions. Are you witnessing to anybody, yes or no? Now this is between you and the Lord. Are you witnessing to anyone, yes or no? And if no, why not? And so that's the question. Are we witnessing to someone? Now remember the interpersonal relationship witnessing. Sometimes we, we can witness that approach as we're witnessing to someone with, without even talking about God. They're seeing God in us. But we're intentional about it. And so, uh, remember, we are called to witness. And, and that's so crucial. And when we do, then people will get saved. If every Christian witnessed to three people, statistically, one person will come to the Lord. Statistically, if you invite four people to church, one will come. And statistically, if you witness to three people, one will come to the Lord. Statistically. So think about that. And so think of three people in your life that don't know the Lord. Do you want them to be lost forever? Do you want them to, to go to hell to be subjected to the worst pain and agony that ever be imagined? And, and so this is, this is what is so amazing. We have the answer. We have the answer. But we got to tell them or live it. So this is not an easy week. This isn't an easy week. It gets harder. <laughs> but I got faith in you. I got faith in you. Paula? I would say more challenging, not harder. Okay, okay. More challenging. So, All right. Hey, I love y'all. I love you, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here. And, and um, I believe that God wants to do something, and I believe God has, but I believe that God wants to do something neat here at Ash Avenue. I believe that. Amen. And, but it doesn't matter if I believe it. It matters if we are living it. Right. And not just me living it. We are living it. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. I got a call this, this, earlier this week from a, a very interesting woman in Tridelphia. And God has told her to put up a tent in her backyard and she is going around everywhere saying she's going to have a revival in June and that God told her to get hold of the top speakers in the Ohio Valley. And so she called me and she said, I want you to come preach. And I said, who are you? <laughs> Don't why, are, why are you calling me? <laughs> and she said, and I said, and, and how do you know about me? She says, I'm watching you every week on YouTube. She says, God has said you are to be here in one night. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I thought, I'm talking to a nutcase. <laughs> Who's going to put up a tent in the backyard of her backyard and invite people to come hear Jesus? And then you know what? The Lord spanked me. And he said, wouldn't it be wonderful if every one of us put up a tent in our backyard? And I thought, wow. So there's a woman who says she has to make a witness. And I thought, what if every one of us was like that? What if we, what if we caught that fire? That's what revival is. You see, we revival is having Mitch Birch. Revival is having a special speaker. Revival is having three nights. Revi that's not revival. That's, that's wonderful. Revival is when we start putting up tents in our backyard. That's revival. So I want to encourage you. I, I want to encourage you. Get out and witness. Now, you're going to get shot down. But don't be afraid. You're going to be called names. But don't worry about that. Stand firm. Because people need to hear Jesus. All right, I've kept you way too long. So, all right, I'm going to dismiss. I'm going to pray for you all. Please rise with me. <laughs> After I pray for us, what I want us to do is, is I, you're going to start witnessing here. And so I want you to go to someone. I want you to tell them God loves them. I ain't doing that. Well, if you're not going to witness in here, you're not going to witness out there. <laughs> If you can't turn in here and say God loves you to someone, then you won't do it out there. That's just real. So, I'm going to have you start witnessing before you walk out those doors.
Father, thank you for this time, and, and thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you use us in perfect vessels. You use us jars of clay, us, us broken down people. I, I, I praise you that you come into our lives and you make all things new. And you make us beautiful creations and you give us all a testimony. Everyone in this room has a testimony. Everyone in this room has can tell how we came to know you. And, and Lord, I ask that you'll be this week with my brothers and sisters because as they write things out, as they as they think about it, as they process, I, I know, Lord, that it's, it's going to be a stretching for some. And Lord, also I ask that we witness. May we be like the woman putting up a tent in her backyard. May we be that which says, I'm going to make a stand for Jesus Christ. And may we be telling people about you because people need you. And that's why we're here. That's why the church is here. The church is here. We are the church to let others know that God loves them. So, Father, bless my brothers and sisters. I ask, Lord, that uh, when the enemy comes against them, that like we talked Sunday, he's defeated. He has no place. I ask, Lord, that, that you'll be with them in a very special way. I ask, Lord, that you will wrap your arms of love and encouragement and strength around them. And, Lord, I'm excited about what you're doing. And, and Lord, uh, let, it, let revival begin. And let it begin in me. Let it begin in each one of us. Let, let that holy fire catch us ablaze. And let us turn to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.